With Clemson just about three weeks away, Georgia camp is abuzz with all sorts of happenings. So we got Palmer Toms on the line from Dogs 247 Sports to help us uh, break it down. Palmer, you've got uh, your hands full. Yeah, it's been it's been a chaotic start to camp so far. Georgia wrapped up their first week yesterday with the first scrimmage. We're now 10 days in with a couple days off. So, you know, it's it's been action packed and, uh, you know, certainly excited to to be back in a routine of, uh, you know, covering the dogs and, and getting ready for that big game you mentioned against Clemson coming up here before too long. So first and foremost, uh, you've got the former five star tight end Eric Gilbert who, of course, uh, started his career at LSU, caught 35 passes last year. He's made a detour to Gainesville, Florida, then to uh, back his home state, uh, and, uh, the Peach State there at Georgia. But um, unfortunately, uh, he's had to at least temporarily leave the team. Yeah, yesterday, I think the biggest storyline out of yesterday's scrimmage would be the absence of Gilbert there. Um, you know, he, he was, Kirby Smart was asked about it after the scrimmage, and and – you know, the, 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 the consensus was, hey, Eric, we, we love you. We, we're looking out for you. Um, you know, that, that Georgia is a place to be where, where we can help you through whatever is going on in his life. And, and I don't know, you know, full details of, all of, of, of it all. Um, I don't think anybody probably, probably outside of Eric Gilbert knows all the details. I would, I would consider Kirby Smart, you know, probably in, in not in the full know either, um, you know, I think first and foremost, the the thoughts and prayers are with Gilbert off the field and going through whatever he's going through. Um, But then also, you know, the attention turns to the impact that he was expected to have on the field. Georgia was expecting him and and counting on him to be part of the the group effort to replace the lost production of George Pickens, you know, who who goes down with an injury in spring practice, torn ACL. There's a chance that he could be back. He's still with the team and and going through rehab and, and everything we've heard so far is, is positive there, but there's, there's no chance that he's playing against Clemson in a couple weeks here. And, and Georgia needs that production from a big bodied receiver like Gilbert, everything we had heard about what he was doing in, in the summer and early in camp was was positive that he was making an impact and that he was just you know such a dynamic guy who's who's got that too big to be covered by a cornerback but too fast to be covered by a linebacker uh, you, you know you need a big bodied receiver like that and Georgia was really counting on Gilbert to be that guy I think the the loss of him if if it ends up happening uh, that that he doesn't end up suiting up in a Georgia uniform which there's been no sort of indication that that is is happening uh you know i think that there's just a lot of concern over when someone steps away from the team like that and unexpectedly uh that that situations could happen and i think everyone immediately thinks back to jamie newman's opt-out last year where georgia was counting on him so heavily at the quarterback position and and then he you know around this time last year two couple weeks in a camp decides to step away from the team for his own personal matters um you know, I think Georgia fans can't help but think about that and uh, the impact that that had on the season. If if Gilbert does not suit up in a Georgia uniform, it's certainly a big blow. But I, I definitely think that Georgia still has the wide receivers and the talent on that offense that, that they can withstand that blow. It's it's not going to make it easier knowing that he could have had a huge impact if if he doesn't end up playing. But um, you know, I think, like I said, first and foremost, thoughts are with. Uh, Eric, as he goes through this situation, and and then you know, secondary is is the impact that he could have on the football field. And while everybody's curious about um, Eric Gilbert's situation, I think you stated it uh, as well as it can be stated. Thoughts and prayers go out to Eric, and uh, certainly it's none of anybody's business in regards to what uh, he's going through uh, outside of uh, his inner circle. Um, so you had kind of addressed uh, the situation wide receiver as it stands without Gilbert, um, uh, anything else to report in regards to bumps and bruises and who would fit in where? Yeah. You know, I I think when you're, whenever you're looking at a first scrimmage with, with how little information that we're getting out of camp, you know, seeing stuff, talking to coaches, the the first camp, the first preseason scrimmage is always eye opening in terms of the bumps and bruises that, that you're withstanding in, in camp. And, um, you know, Kirby Smart emphasizes that he wants this camp to be physical. It's it's not about preparing for Clemson. It's about preparing for the entire season. And, and 
you know, in order to do that, you've got to be, you know, a physical, if you're going to be a physical football team, you got to have a physical camp and physical practices. And so Georgia's had a couple of injuries uh, in, in, in the wide receiver room. Jermaine Burton suffered a sprained ankle. He missed the scrimmage yesterday, uh, but they are expecting him to be back on the field this week in practice. I, I think that, you know, he probably, if, if this is the Clemson game, he's pushing through it there is, is my guess. Uh, but I think if, if you're Georgia's coaching staff with the scare that he had earlier in, in the spring with a, a knee injury there, you know, tweaked it a little bit, uh, you know, you, and, and the loss that you had at the receiver position already with Pickens with a serious injury, you want to be extra precautionary there. And, and you don't want to take any chances of pushing a guy too hard. You know, like I said, if it, if it was a game, if it was the Clemson game, if it was a big time, you know, matchup, he's probably in the lineup there. But, you know, for precautionary reasons, he was out of the scrimmage yesterday. Um, another guy that Georgia was missing was Kyrus Jackson, who had a knee scope uh, done prior to SEC media days in July. Uh, that, that's something that Georgia knew about headed into camp. He is continuing to work his way back. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, Kirby Smart said that they, they really are expecting him to be you know, back in practice, uh, ready to go this week. He he was participating in a black non-contact jersey uh, in in the seven on seven, going through drills. So he's he's making good progress in his return. I think you you know you also got to think about Dominic Blaylock, who's returning from a torn ACL. Uh, that that's a guy that Georgia could be counting on at the receiver position. Uh, Marcus Rosemi Jack Saint is making his way back from an injury that he suffered. Uh, you know, right around in, in the Florida game last year, I think that was the sixth game of the season there. Um, you know, for Georgia, that, that was a tough blow to lose him, but he has fully made his way back, uh, was was on the field again in a non-contact jersey during the spring, but is back and, and going through full practices, uh, was with the team in workouts this summer and, and is with the team now in practice. That's a huge addition for Georgia. You know, we talked to offensive coordinator Todd Munkin on, uh, Thursday, and and he mentioned him as one of the three returning guys with experience, along with Burton and Jackson. So I, I think, like I said, Georgia's got some you know bumps and bruises at the wide rec- wide receiver position. It's nothing that's too serious, nothing that would probably keep these guys out from playing in the Clemson game, with the exception of maybe Blaylock making his way back uh, and rehabbing that ACL injury. Uh, but I but I think you know Georgia feels very confident in what they've got. You know, you've got playmakers like Arian Smith, who's who's showing out well in camp so far. Dar- uh, Darnell Washington is a, is a guy that they're really excited about at the tight end position. Big body guy that I think they can use in various ways. They can use him as an inline tight end. They can split him out. You know, very similar to the ways that I think that they probably would and, and still could use Eric Gilbert. Um, you know, Gilbert was recruited to be a wide receiver, not a tight end versus Washington is a tight end and not a wide receiver. But I think, you know, with the way that football is played now and, and you know, how much things are spread out, you see those guys, uh, you know, mixing it up and, and splitting out into the slot sometimes, some of those big bodied uh, tight ends. I think another tight end that they're really excited about is, uh, you know, Brock Bowers, true freshman out of California. He's He's been, you know, going through his first camp. And then a guy that is more experienced at that position uh, would be John Fitzpatrick, not necessarily as much of a pass catcher. He's caught a couple passes throughout his career. Um, believe he had a touchdown last season. Um, but, you know, D- Georgia definitely feels very confident in what they've got in that tight end room and, the, you know, what they can do to use the weapons around JT Daniels, uh, who is also apparently having a pretty good camp so far. I-, I would say the defense is probably ahead of the offense so far, but I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, what Georgia returns on the defensive line that, that, they feel very confident in that they know what they've got there. You know, a, a situation where you've got your solidified starting four solidified three or four guys that are rotating in and out there that they, they didn't really lose anything on the defensive line. So, you know, when you've got questions on the offensive line and, you, and you're mixing things up there, that defensive line is going to give them trouble, which in, you know, in return gives, gives the quarterback trouble, gives the run game trouble, gives the entire offense trouble. So I think, you know, Georgia's fans should still feel very confident in what they've got offensively with the weapons that are there, uh, with these guys that are making their way back from injuries. But you got to understand that they're going against one of the best defenses that they'll play all season, uh, you know, in preseason practice. And, and, and they'll be doing the same week one against Clemson. But, you know, what better way to prepare for a matchup like that than going against Dan Lanning and Kirby Smart's defense every day? 
Fitzpatrick caught 10 last year with that touchdown that you mentioned against Arkansas in the opener. Darnell Washington showed some explosive uh, ability downfield with uh, just the seven catches, but 23 yards per catch last year. And as you mentioned, uh, Bowers, uh, third rated tight end in the nation coming out of uh, California. When you add up the losses of Jackson, Burton and Pickens, that's 99 catches, top three receivers uh, in terms of productivity last year. Um, but that's again, one of the reasons why, and the Georgia roster is one of the very few in college football that can sustain these kind of injuries to a certain extent, but that is a lot of injuries this early to one position group. Got Palmer Tom's on the line from dogs, two, four, seven sports, breaking down Georgia football. Of course, the Clemson opener is just about three weeks away and counting everybody looking forward to what is probably the best nine conference matchup of college football. Uh, let's stay on the offensive side with the offensive line. Another strong point, typically for the Bulldogs. Um, what did uh, you take out of the first uh, 10 uh, sessions plus the scrimmage? Yeah, I think the biggest story on the offensive line coming into camp was what, what, who was going to be the starter at left tackle? Was it going to be Jamari Salyer, you know, who started 10 game, nine games at left tackle last season, has a start at right tackle under his belt two seasons ago? Uh, you know, I think Georgia knows what they've gotten him, but they've also got some incredibly talented guys, five stars lined up behind him that could potentially play left tackle, allowing Salyer to bump inside to his more natural guard position. That would be Xavier Trust, Broderick Jones, and Marius Mims. Those three guys are really competing for that left tackle spot and, and have a chance that, you know, if, if you could have one of those guys play left tackle, there probably are more true natural tackles that would allow – the offensive line to look and, and play, have guys playing in their natural positions, you know, bumping Salyer into guard. And then on the right side at guard, having a rotation of Justin Schaefer and Tate Ratledge coming, you know, like I said, that was the, the storyline coming into camp coming out of that first scrimmage. The, the st storyline completely centers around and the focus completely centers around the center. Um, and, and I think that's, that's because, of an injury that suffered by Warren Erickson. He has a hand injury. He's in a cast on his right hand, his snapping hand. And, and that's a really t in tough injury to battle if, if, if you've got to use your hand like that. You know, Kirby Smart said they've had guys play through that injury, but they've never had a center try and snap with that injury. You, you can put a cast on and, and tape it up and play guard or tackle with that injury where you're just, you know, using your hands to, to block, but – it's, it's tough to grab a ball if you've got a broken hand uh, and, and certainly tough to snap it and, and be consistently accurate with that. And, and you can't afford any slip ups there. So Georgia's kind of battling the injury bug there. Smart feels confident that, that Erickson will be cleared to play by the Clemson game. It's just a matter of whether he's comfortable to play by that time. He, he's been, you know, he, he smart told us that, that Erickson had the surgery had the cast put on and then was immediately trying to snap with his right hand right after that, trying to get comfortable again uh, and, and, you know, kind of see where things are at. He also has the ability to snap with his left hand. And I think that's something that they're trying out, but I think that more than likely they would prefer to go to someone who's snapping with their dominant hand and, and very comfortable doing so rather than playing a guy with a cast on his right hand and snapping with his non-dominant left hand. Uh, and, and so if, if that's the case and Erickson does miss time, uh, and, and potentially misses that opener against Clemson, you're going to be looking at Cedric Van Pran or Jamari Salyer, who I mentioned has experience at tackle and guard. He's played everywhere on the offensive line, and, and he's going to be in that starting five, assuming that he's, assuming that he's healthy. Um, you know, and I think that's not a given for Georgia at any position right now. You, with a physical camp like you've got, you can never just assume that someone's going to be healthy um, but you know, if, if he's ready to go for that and, and healthy for that Clemson game, he will be in the starting lineup, whether it's at tackle guard or center, uh, Van Pran being the former number one center in his class has a, a ton of upside. And, and, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a given that Warren Erickson was going to be the starter. I think he, he's got the experience. He played the last couple of games after Trey Hill suffered a knee injury, uh, and, and missed the last couple of games of last season. So Erickson played center. Uh, he's also got experience at guard. You know, that's one thing that, that Georgia fans should feel really confident in on this offensive line is that you're not necessarily looking for the best player at each position. You're looking for the best five total. And, and whether that's, you know, moving someone in from their, nat you know, more natural position to somewhere that they're 
you know, not nearly as comfortable. If, if they're one of the best five, Kirby Smart and Matt Luke want them out there. And so, you know, with, with the center position, you're looking at a, you know, a, a natural center in Cedric Van Pran that also has experience playing guard. Um, and, and, you know, a natural guard in Jamari Salyer that has experience playing both tackle and center. If he does win the job, and I, and I think it probably – in, in an ideal world, obviously, Kirby Smart would like to have the options of Erickson or uh, Van Pran. Austin Blasky is also another guy who's been getting some snaps in there at center. Uh, I, I think they want to they want to have feel very confident in at least two guys for that Clemson game, uh, if not more. And, and I think you know they're they're trying to you know they're always trying to find guys that can snap the ball and and build up that in their repertoire. Um, you know, I, I think in, in an ideal world. Kirby Smart, you know, let's say Erickson is out. Kirby Smart would like to be starting Cedric Van Fran at center, which allows J- Jamari Salyer to play at one of his more natural positions, guard or tackle, where he has the experience, more of his experience uh, at, at least. Um, you know, he's got starts under his belt at both those positions versus he's he's got reserve time at center. Um, you know, I, I think that if Van Fran can win that job, then the focus turns to uh, the left tackle position and – whether or not someone has, you know, one of those three that I mentioned earlier in Trust, Jones, and Mims, whether one of them has emerged as as a starter at that position where you can then put Salyer at guard if one of those guys hasn't emerged. And, and, and I will say, I think that if, if Georgia, if one of those guys is to emerge, my bet would be on Xavier Truss. He's got some starting experience under his belt. He started the uh, Peach Bowl against Cincinnati at left tackle. Um, you know, former highly rated guy, but but so are Mims and, and uh, Jones as well, former five stars there. I, I think if, if, if Georgia can feel confident in that left tackle position, you would like to see uh, Salyer bump inside if you're a Georgia fan and, and have him playing at a position that he probably has all American potential at guard. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to have your left tackle, your, your guy that's protecting your quarterback's blind side, being a question mark, especially against the, this defensive line that they're going up against. So my bet would be on Salyer playing left tackle uh, in, in the opener and having Justin Schaefer at left guard and Tate Ratledge at right guard, uh, assuming that Van Pran wins out at center. If not, then it's going to be Salyer at center. It, it would be my guess with Truss at left tackle. And then again, the guard positions being Schaefer and Ratledge with Warren McClendon holding down the right tackle position uh, in, in any of these scenarios. So offensive line, certainly, you know, not necessarily a question mark. Uh, there, there's definitely a ton of talent there. Like I said, a bunch of five-star guys, a bunch of guys that, that have all American potential, but you know, something, a storyline that you should be watching if, if you're paying attention to Georgia camp. Great stuff as always from uh, Palmer Toms, and we've just got him started here. Uh, you can catch him on Dogs 247 Sports, of course. Please like the video, share the videos out on social media, because if you enjoy the content that we provide each and every day, others will as well, so bring them on in or do it the old-fashioned way. Just call, text, talk to somebody, let people know we're talking college football here at the Voice of College Football. Palmer, I should have hit on this uh, when we were talking wide receivers, uh, but everybody always wants to know about the quarterback position, and especially with JT Daniels showing so much promise but having a limited um, uh, repertoire, limited um, resume coming in against Mississippi State, tossing up the 400 yards and playing well down the stretch and, of course, winning the Peach Bowl. Just uh, what JT's working on, what are some of the um, – information coming out of camp concerning his development yeah I, th- I think the biggest thing would be his comfort level and and being that being both mentally and physically you know last year he was coming off of a, an ACL injury of his own knee you know a question mark was all season was how healthy was his knee and and if his knee had been healthy would he have been starting earlier my guess is that his knee was probably not healthy enough and, and that I think that's a question that may not ever be answered. Kirby Smart's not going to give away that information. JT Daniels isn't going to give away that information. Uh, you know, I, I, my guess is that he probably wasn't healthy and confident enough in his knee to be the starter uh, early on. And when, when Georgia was necessarily struggling at the quarterback position uh, and, and looking at the difference is between, uh, you know, what they had in those first six games and, and those final four games uh, between, you know, Bennett and Mathis in the first six and Daniels as the consistent starter in the final four, you know, I, I think that physically that's, that's where he feels a lot more comfortable. And then mentally just 
having a second year in this system with offensive coordinator Todd Munkin, I think everyone on that offense feels more comfortable because you you've got a traditional off season that you that you've under you know you've you've been through you've been through a traditional spring you've been through a traditional summer of workouts and stuff you know you're you're getting to meet in person to do some of these install periods versus last year everything was on Zoom and everything was so weird and and it was just you know. Georgia was Georgia was fighting an uphill battle putting in that offense offensively the entire season because um, you know because of the hurdles that they had to clear putting in an offense and and doing that in the COVID era um, you know I, I obviously you know there, there's still some restrict restrictions and regulations but being able to get, have that spring and being able to you know be together this summer be together this fall in a, in a traditional setting. I think that's been huge for Daniels and the entire offense. I think, you know, he may not have had his best day. He, he probably didn't throw for 401 yards yesterday in the scrimmage. But like we said earlier, he's working with, with a, you know, he's short staffed at wide, wide receiver. Uh, he, he's got some guys that he feels comfortable, comfortable in and they weren't necessarily out there. And so, you know, I, I think Georgia fans should still feel very confident in what they've got with JT Daniels, especially given the fact that he feels so much comf more comfortable and, and Todd Munkin and this entire offense, all the players around him feel so much more comfortable. Palmer Toms, uh, Dogs 247 Sports, uh, joins us on a regular basis to break down Georgia. And, of course, uh, it's the big game that everybody's awaiting, Georgia and Clemson. And, uh, Palmer, when we look at the defense, uh, two things that uh, we wanted to hit on tie directly to one another. Of course, the defensive backfield has been um, a big topic of uh, – concern and so forth because of Tyreek Stevenson moving on to Miami, two big pickups of the uh, West Virginia and Clemson during the off season. Uh, and, but then also the pass rush, obviously uh, the pass rush can make the defensive secondary look awfully good. If it's where it needs to be minus Aziz Ojalari, who uh, moves on with about 10 sacks and uh, 12 and a half um, tackles for loss uh, in a short season. So where's the development uh, stand there? Yeah, I'll start with the pass rush, you know, where, where Georgia feels very confident in their front seven. I think the question mark would be on the on the in that back end of the secondary. Uh, you know, I think, like you said, replacing Aziz Ojolari is, is certainly an emphasis of theirs. You've also got Jermaine Johnson that left that outside linebacker room, transferred to Florida State. He was a very highly rated recruit out of uh, Independence uh, Community College, junior college guy. Uh Georgia feels confident in what they've got with Adam Anderson. And, and I think a lot of Georgia fans are really expecting big things from him this year, given the fact that he's going to have more opportunities. He's got, you know, he's, he's going into his fourth year with the program. He's, he's been an impact player each and every year, but he hasn't had the, you know, the, the opportunities, the reps, uh, you know, he's been splitting time with Ojolari Johnson. You know, you had Brenton Cox in that room originally, uh, when those two guys came in together, now he's obviously now at Florida. And, and then Nolan Smith as well, um, former number one ranked recruit in his 2019 signing class. Um, you know, and Anderson is is a guy that I think Georgia fans feel can be the number one. But you want to find some depth at that position. And, and especially given the fact that Georgia rotates so many guys, has rotated so many guys in the past in that room. It's, it, it's going to be tough to just completely ignore that and, and go to just a one-man show there. And so I think Nolan Smith behind him, we've heard really great things about Smith coming out of this camp. Uh, we, we spoke with defensive coordinator and outside linebackers coach, actually, Dan Lanning, uh, earlier this week on Tuesday. And he was saying that they've got, you know, they're, they're putting an emphasis on that pass rush and they've got a pass rusher of the day that they, uh, you know, kind of name in, in their team meetings and that Nolan Smith has been on there several times that he feels, you know, that, that one of the things that they really focus on and emphasize with their coaches is, is the developing players and that they feel very confident in the ways that Nolan Smith has developed from year one to year two and year two to year three. Uh, you know, it's kind of sim very similar to Adam Anderson. I think with the extra opportunities, uh, you can probably expect some extra production. Uh, other guys in that room are Robert Beal, MJ Sherman, um, you know, those are two guys that, that have been around the program. Beal is an upperclassman. Sherman coming into his second year. I think expectations are also high with both of them. You know, two very talented guys that, given the opportunity, can probably perform uh, that, that just haven't had that opportunity because they've been buried down on the depth chart behind some of those guys that we've mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, they're, again, neither one of them is probably going to be the, you know, one in that top two. Uh, but, 
you know, Georgia will probably be counting on them to make a play here or there. And it's, it's certainly going to be important for, you know, fans to be able to rely on them, co- the coaches to be able to count on them to make those plays if their name is called. Uh, and, and then going to the secondary, like we were talking about, I think uh, once again, that was, we, we talked about left tackle being a question mark coming into camp um, and, and this spring as well. I, I think the other question mark would have been in, in the secondary and, and who was going to be the guys to step up at cornerback. And, and Georgia goes out and gets Darian Kendrick out of the transfer portal from Clemson. Uh, he, he's probably going to be the solidified number one starter at, at corner. Um, you know, after you lose guys like Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell, DJ Daniel, all three of those went to the NFL, uh, you know, and, and essentially two first round picks because you had Stokes in the first round and then Campbell with the first pick of the second round, um, two very, you know, top 33 picks. Uh, you know, you had two first round corners out there the last two years. Um, and, and, and really, if you, even if you want to look further back, you had De- DeAndre Baker playing opposite of those two guys uh, when they were youngsters as freshmen. Um, you know, I, I think Georgia has, has found a cornerback that they feel very confident in, in Darian Kendrick. He was not at the scrimmage yesterday. Uh, he had a friend of his uh, pass away, so he was at a funeral. Um, but, you know, Kirby Smart said that he has been with the team at practice. He's back with the team now. Uh, back in Athens and, and that he has been really showing out and, and showing his ability to, uh, you know, pick up on some things. I think that they were, were maybe a little bit concerned about the learning curve that, that Kirby Smart and this defense has in the secondary uh, and, and that Kendrick has, has blown their expectations out of the water. He comes from a system where they ran, you know, multiple different schemes in the secondary and that he's really, really picking up on things well uh, with Kirby Smart, Dan Lanning, and new defensive backs coach, Jamal Adai. Uh, opposite of him, you're probably looking at a battle between, um, you know, Amir Speed is a, is a veteran guy. Keely Ringo is a very talented guy, former number one corner. And then Jalen Kimber as well. Nylon Green, I, I don't know that he would be in the battle for, uh, you know, maybe the number one spot, but certainly in the battle for playing time. Kamari Lassiter is a guy that they brought in in this class alongside Green. And, and, and Lavassier Carroll, who was a running back out of IMG, they flipped him over to, uh, the seg- to play corner this spring, kind of out of a, a more of an emergency thing there where they wanted to see him, especially because they, they know what they've got in the running back room. They've got five guys there, and, and Carroll wasn't necessarily going to have the opportunities this year. They wanted to see what he could do in the secondary, and, and he's been looking great so far, um, you know, ha- made some plays in the spring and, and has, you know, flashed in the fall as well. Um, you know, I, going back to the starting position opposite of Kimber, I think you're looking at speed. Uh, excuse me, opposite of Kendrick, you're looking at Speed, Kimber, and Ringo as those those three guys. Uh, yes, in yesterday's scrimmage, Speed and Ringo were the two starters with Kendrick gone to the funeral, and Jalen Kimber was out with a shoulder injury. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, Georgia fans feel that they've got enough. It, it's not a, t- a talent issue there. It's It's an experience issue. None of those guys have a ton of experience. I think you know, speed has the most experience of them all being an upperclassman, a senior. Um, but you're also looking at a very talented guy like like Keely Ringo, who didn't get to play at all last year. So he's, you know, fresh on the scene uh, and, and you know, learning the thing, learning the ways as, as time goes. You know, Kirby Smart said yesterday that he hasn't essentially played tackle football in over two years because he missed out on s- spring practice in 2020 after his senior year of high school. He they discovered a torn labrum that he suffered in high school, had surgery, missed all of the 2020 season. And, and then, you know, spring this year, you take it for what it is. It's, it's spring practice and, and you're not, you know, getting live reps. Uh, so he hasn't played a football game since he was a senior in high school, since the all American game. Um, and so, you know, I think Georgia is going, it, it's, it's going to be a learning curve there at, at the cornerback position. George's probably going to play all three of those guys in that opener, assuming that they're all healthy. Uh, and, and I don't think there's any reason to believe that they wouldn't be. I would imagine that Kimber's injury is probably something that he's going to be quickly back. We, we've seen photos of him out at practice this week. So, you know, probably a little bit dinged up there and, and the, more of a precautionary thing to keep him out of the scrimmage. I would, like I said, I would imagine that all three of those guys are playing against Clemson. Uh, and, and then, you know, at star, it's a it's a battle between Tyke Smith, the West Virginia transfer, and Latavius Brainy. Uh, those two guys, Kirby Smart said, 
you know, if, if you look at last year and, and what Georgia did at the star position, they played two guys. They played Tyreek Stevenson, like you mentioned. He transferred to Miami. And they played Mark Webb, who was drafted by the Chargers. Uh, and, and, you know, those two guys, maybe not from a skill set standpoint in, in Smith and Brini, maybe they're not the same as Webb and Stevenson there. But, but from the perspective of the idea of the fact that you can play them, uh, both of them in, in a single game, it, it, that's going to be huge for Georgia because, again, with how much these secondary players, how much these corners are running and covering receivers, uh, you want to have depth at, the, at that position. Brainy and Smith also provide depth at safety behind Lewis Seen and Chris Smith, uh, where Georgia's a little bit thin on, on numbers there. Um, but, but certainly, you know, those two guys are standing out from the pack. They're, they're neck and neck is what Kirby Smart said uh, in terms of, you know, how they're battling at the star position. I would imagine that, you, again, like that second corner position opposite of Kendrick, I would imagine you'll be seeing both Smith, Tyke Smith and Keely, and, and excuse me, Latavius Brini on the field at star against Clemson. And of course, uh, Palmer on the coaching front, we've got a situation involving Scott Cochran, who unfortunately has to step away due to personal issues. And Will Muschamp, new to the coaching staff himself, has to take uh, on another responsibility. Yeah, and, and, you know, Scott Cochran came to Georgia last year from Alabama, was the former strength and conditioning coach over there. Uh, you know, an exciting hire when that happened, especially because, you know, with him being an on-field coach as the special teams coordinator, you can have him go into the living room of recruits and, and be, you know, active in the recruiting. Uh, you know, that that is that is the case and, and, and now will be the case with Will Muschamp moving him from an off-field quality control defensive analyst kind of position on the field to taking over that special teams coordinator position, um, you know, while Cochran is away from the program, it, it is huge to be able to add a guy with SEC head coaching experience, coached at Florida, coached at South Carolina, and now is on the field at Georgia. I think he was going to be a big part and, and he's been helping in recruiting even in his off field role, uh, you know, with, with the visits that these kids were doing this, this summer uh, you know, Muschamp was a big part of that, as well as, um, you know, on the field, he's been able to help some in, in, in some capacity. Uh, you know, I think now that he is fully on the field as, as an on-field coach and, and is going to be able to be down there on game days, that's just an extra hand that you can have helping coach defense, offense, special teams. You know, as a head coach, he's got experience with kind of with everything. And uh, so, you know, you, you can help, you can have him help him with the secondary, you can have him help him with you know, anything on defense with his defensive coordinator background. And then, like I said, as a head coach, he's, he's certainly got some experience, uh, you know, got his hands in the offense. Um, in terms of his role with special teams, Kirby Smart said that, um, you know, the, the head coaches, a lot of people think that if you're a head coach, you're probably staying away from special teams, that you're not, you know, dealing with that on a daily basis. And, and, and that's just wrong. You know, I think, these head coaches are, are very involved in the game planning of special teams. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's been a group effort for Georgia in the past with special teams. Scott Cochran was not the only person involved in coaching the special teams. Uh, tight ends coach Todd Hartley helps with the punt coverage. Uh, and, and, and he's also got some special teams coordinating experience from his time at Miami. Uh, you know, now you've got Muschamp, who's got the experience as a head coach. Uh, that has been very involved in special teams. And, and you've got some off-field guys as well uh, that, that have some special teams experience, uh, quality control kind of guys that can help, you know, implement game plans, come up with new ideas. So it's it's going to be all hands on deck for Georgia when it comes to special teams. But it's it's certainly a big uh, upgrade, not necessarily an upgrade, but, but big news to be able to get a former SEC head coach on the field in a, in a capacity like that. Plenty of news and notes from Dogs Camp, uh, courtesy uh, Palmer Toms from Dogs 247 Sports. Uh, Palmer, we hope you know how much we appreciate you stopping by and breaking down the dogs for us uh, on a regular basis. And uh, again, another great report. And I'm sure everybody around uh, Georgia camps excited about Clemson. Uh, the, the clock is ticking. Yes, yes. The clock is ticking. We're getting ever so closer by the day. And I, I'm sure I'll be back on here before too long to preview that game with you. <laughs> 